the city of Chicago. I'm already here. Please go. It's an austerity economy. 
One where if you, depending on who you are and who you know, when it comes to requests or projects that need to be funded, economic development projects, you get the scarcity narrative. I've experienced this on numerous occasions. And I contrast this with the experience of those who are in the know or who are correct, those who have billions of dollars because they want to build a museum on Prize Lake Frontland. And so all of a sudden, imagination kicks in, right? We can, we can gather everyone together, draft a new proposal that contemplates $1.2 billion of additional borrowing on top of what we're already in debt, about $8 billion. And the biggest issue that we get 
is business owners, entrepreneurs getting access to capital. You need access to capital to buy equipment, sometimes to expand, to get more space. If you wanted to take your business to the next level, and what happens is they go to traditional financial institutions and they get turned down. If you are in a community, for example, on the west side, on the south side, where redlining was and is the norm, then you know the challenges with getting capital. Those challenges still exist. So as we're talking about the need to create a growth economy, a growth economy is an economy in which people can get access to capital so that they can start businesses. What happens when they start their business? They can hire locally. What happens when you hire locally? Not people actually have jobs. And hopefully we're paying them at least $15 an hour. Right? What does that mean? That means more money to spend. What does that mean? Now we're actually able to pay whatever taxes, you can pay your tickets, even those things. When you have money to spend, you can actually pay for those things. Right now we don't have it. And so the small business, small business growth is absolutely essential. We do a lot for large corporations. They already get tax incentives. Unfortunately, a lot of them get access to TIF dollars. Uh, when other projects that are more locally focused, you get those dollars. But with small businesses, you actually create an environment of growth. The other is home loans. We had in 2008, I was actually working in the mayor's office in the previous administration when the housing crisis hit. This is 2007, 2008. And people were simply underwater in their homes. I looked in neighborhoods where you had vacancy rates, maybe one or two houses on a block. I've worked in communities on the south side where you have broad swaths of land where a lot of those homes are fast-track demo, so they don't even exist anymore, just open land. What would have happened if people had access to home loans, low interest home loans that could help them stay in their home or even purchase a home? The city put together a couple of programs, one is called NSP, and it was designed to get people to rehabilitate these homes. Well, how can you rehab homes if you don't have any buyers? If you don't have people who actually have access to capital, they can move into the home. <coughs> so a lot of those homes sit vacant. What happens when homes are vacant? You're not getting property taxes from those properties. So as we've seen the largest decline in population, 200,000 between 2000 and 2010. That's property tax dollars leaving the city. That's the city's revenue leaving. So when our population constricts, it means we actually can't collect as much in revenue so that we can make sure that the city is fully funded. This is why a growth economy is absolutely necessary. So access to home loans. Now, if you're like me and spend a lot of time in school, and you get that call from Sally Bay or whoever, student loans. Many of my colleagues, my peers, are in trouble with their student loans. This is huge. Everyone sort of bought into the narrative of going to college. They did what they were supposed to do. The loans were there. And now that's the next bubble after the housing crisis. It's actually student loans, and it might actually be worse. I think it's somewhere with a trillion dollars right now. So now we're not just talking about the present. We're talking about the future. We're talking about the individuals that should be entering our workforce, who we would hope would have the ability to actually find jobs to buy homes, if you'll notice what's happening in the economy, many of them are going back to their parents' house. I mean, this is late 20s and 30s. They're going back to live with their parents. And if you're paying $2,000 in student loan payments per month, and you're living in the city of Chicago, and maybe you own a property, do people start families in that environment? Do people feel stability? Is there stability in that environment? It is. So the economy continues to constrict. A public bank actually addresses all of the elements that create a growth economy. It is a fundamental shift in direction. What we've seen in the past, you might have, if you've talked about, I ran on the financial transaction tax. I ran on worker on cooperatives. These things that are markedly different from the economy that we now have. And in the past, in previous years, you always ran into people who said, well, that's impossible. Oh, you can't do it. Oh, it's going to take the state and the country and the national level. And there was always that impossibility narrative. Well, now as people are seeing their property tax bills, they should have received at least, I think, at least one, one of the bills. And as the best
best ideas that our elected representatives have put forth are taxing the roads. I don't know what was that tax that I think it was Cullerton put forth about taxing the mileage on the roads, okay, yeah. some flat rates. These are the best ideas. Now, what I've had the opportunity to do over the last years, I've been in meetings where we're talking about revenue options for the city. And the conversation is around well, how do we say we generated an extra 50000 an extra 100000 Oh, if we, I mean, there's some ideas that have been frightening. And these are your elected officials. And then it's the lack of evidence. So now is an opportunity to shift the narrative. We actually don't have the luxury of the impossibility there. Because what does the future look like? The future looks like the continued displacement of residents who live in the city. The future looks like if you don't make at least $200,000, it doesn't make sense to live in the city. The future looks like 10 people in my network who moved to Texas in the last year. The latest one left last Wednesday. Why? They have young children. They're looking at what's happening with Chicago Public Schools and the fact that you have leadership that does not understand good education policy and practice but prefers to demonize teachers and principals. They're looking at increased property taxes. They're looking at violence. They're looking at the fact that even though they got a raise, it disappeared because they got those five tickets from the speed cameras. And they have to pay. So if that's my anecdotal experience, imagine citywide. What's going on with our population? Which brings me back to the point. As the population constricts, <coughs> our revenues constrict. We cannot maintain the city's solvency on the backs of the individuals and families that are least able to pay. And this is not just an issue of benevolence. This is about sound economic principles. This is not us saying, well, we're imagining a utopia. This is actually about finally moving toward good economic policy and not just political expediency. So we have an opportunity to do that. And with these ideas, those in this book, the idea of a public bank, we can push legislation. I've had the privilege of working with people in Springfield to push legislation on a public bank, on financial transaction tax on a progressive income tax. This is the environment now where we can do that. And we have to be unapologetic about it also. I think there is this notion that the people are dreamers or your, your head is in the clouds and that you're not realistic. And sometimes there's a temerity or being timid about owning the ideas that we believe can actually change the direction of the city. We have to be just as unapologetic about these ideas as they are when they're levying their next tax, when they're giving out their next handout, when they're siphoning those tip dollars, porting them from neighborhoods like mine downtown. They're very unapologetic. And they know what they're doing. But we also know what we're doing. And now we have the tools to arm people with the language so that we amplify the conversation we're having in this room citywide and do it unapologetically.